So now some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. So the take home messages is one, I've gained perspective on what it means to, I think, be more of like a, a well-functioning human in some ways, but also I've gained perspective on some other things as well. I've gained perspective, I think, on biology itself. And I want to use this as an example to help me illustrate what I mean here. This is what I learned in school. So when I was a kid, this is what I thought of as the solar system. In my head, this is what it was. We have these, well, at the time there were nine planets, but it's not really that important. However, I do have a question. I'm going to ask somebody to chime in. Um, maybe, actually, I'm going to ask somebody. Uh, yeah. So I have two, but if you've heard me give this before, obviously I don't want you to give the answer. But there are two things that are fundamentally missing from this picture right, that's in front of us right here. There are two fundamental parts of our solar system that are not depicted at all in this picture. What are those two things that are missing from this static image that you're seeing in front of you? And I don't mean things like asteroid belts or moons or those kinds of things. Think about something that's more fundamental than any of those things. I'll give you a minute though, or however long it takes until somebody wants to chime in and see if they can give me the answer. All right, well, in my opinion, those two things are space and time. Whenever you're looking at any kind of model of any system, and whenever you're trying to model anything in our world, I think, I think if you're not incorporating space and time properly into your model, you're missing so much information, so much that you just, you can't grasp unless you incorporate those things into them as well. What do I mean? Well, look at this. Well, this is still not perfect. This is a much more accurate depiction of what I think our solar system really looks like. We're not just on, on a static planet that's hovering around the sun. We're actually spinning in this vortex around this fiery ball through space and across time. Now, I want though, or, or I'd like you to think about, especially the people here at the NIH, is to think about your models as well that you're using to model these diseases that you're studying. If there are static images in your mind, or even if you're the papers that you're writing, if they're all static, images at the, end of the, at the end of the day that you're trying to portray to the world, then I think you're really going to be missing something very crucial. There's always going to be something critical that you just can't see because you're, you're showing the world an image or you have an image in your mind. You really need to be able to close your eyes and think about in 3D and across time what is actually happening at the cellular level to any of these model systems that you're working with or any of, these, or, or any of the real thing, systems that you're working with as well. In my opinion, if you don't have that um, well, I would say, in my opinion, the best scientists that I've come across, yeah, the best people, best researchers as well, they have that ability. They can actually close their eyes and they can think about the problem for themselves and they can try and model it in their own heads. At the end of the day, I think that all of the best models that we have of Parkinson's disease or whatever diseases that we're studying, they don't exist on paper and they don't exist on a computer even. They exist in the minds of human beings, people like people working here at the NIH, because there's just so much information that gets lost in any static image or any kind of picture that you might try to pick. Um, so yeah, let's move on though to the next point that I want to make. So coming back to this, I've started to rethink how much do we really need to know to actually understand what it means to have Parkinson's disease or any of these other diseases as well. Which of these fields is actually important to understanding what these diseases, this disease is and then helping us all make progress at the end of the day. I think and take this for what you will, but I've come to believe that, or maybe belief is the wrong word, maybe hope is a better word, but I'm not exactly sure at the moment. I think that if we were to understand this a little bit better, and I'm gonna come back to that first image that I showed you now. I think that in there, there's a heuristic that we might be able to apply that might then be able to help us better understand everything that we're learning about this disease and about the brain and about how it actually works at the most fundamental levels. Now, fundamental levels doesn't necessarily mean the bottom either. When I, say, when I talk about the most fundamental, fundamental level of anything in our world, I don't necessarily think that we need to understand every single detail to understand the whole. Uh, what, I, what I think, or maybe what I hope, or what I believe anyway, is that if you really want to grasp something, you have to be able to understand where you can interject. What is the best point for you to actually intervene in the process that you're talking about? It doesn't always have to be at the bottom. If we have to like understand every single gene and every single thing, every single like RNA strand, every single protein, if 
for everything before we understand these diseases, then I think we're going to be sitting here for a long, long time trying to kind of spin this wheel and trying to understand things. So like I said, which kind of heuristics can we apply? Coming back to this image now. Again, close your eyes for a moment and try to just picture this in your mind. Picture it, what it is, or take a look at it again. Try and like grasp it and put it in your brain if you can. And then take a moment and just think about what it could represent or what it could mean as well. So I'll give you my answer in a moment. I'll just take one more moment and just think about this. Okay, so what I think this is, I think it's actually a pretty good uh, illustration of the closed loop nature of how the circuitry in our brain works. What I think of is basically this. Imagine you were able, again, you have to have that image in your mind. So you can actually picture it for yourself and imagine it. But try to zoom in on any of these little clusters of light bulbs that you see in front of you. Close your eyes and try and actually zoom in and try and look at what they look like at the fundamental level. Picture them, if you can, as neurons themselves. Now imagine what happens if you were to close your eyes and one of those neurons were starting to blip out. Those like Sarah or uh, Megan or anyone who was with us yesterday at the uh, exhibit, they did a very good job of illustrating for everybody that was there what it looks like when a neuron actually dies and when it starts to die back. One of the first things that happens is it actually starts to lose connections with things that are around it. Now, then those other things, like um, for any living thing to be alive or for anything to actually be in this world, it has to be able to communicate with the things that are around it. Communication doesn't just mean that it's sending a message out into the world. It has to also be able to send messages back through. So there has to be some input and some output. All living things need that to survive. There's no such thing as a living thing that can't communicate in that sense with this world and in this environment. I think it's the best definition that I've ever come across what it means to be alive is that you can communicate, meaning that you can actually give a message out and then you can get the message back through as well. It's also why I think that adaptive DBS is working so well for me right now. Again, this is just a hypothesis. This isn't just a theory. It's just something that I'm kind of throwing out into the world. But the more I think about it, the more I think that there's a truism there. There's something very true about what I just said. That, that ability to actually adapt to your environment, meaning, so what's happening in my brain is that there's these beta waves that are fluctuating through my brain. There's receptors at the end of the electrodes that are deep in my STN that are reading those beta waves. And then the stimulation is actually adapting accordingly. The reason why in the past, why um, a lot of these uh, systems, they didn't work very well before is because they were dumb systems. They were just systems that were just operating like, like these stupid machines that a lot of us have. They were just firing all at once. Like it was just a continuous stream of electricity that was never changing based on its inputs. This one's actually changing based on the inputs that it's getting from the brain and the rest of the regions of the brain. It's why I think the brain, it's why I think this adaptive kind of DBS might be working so well. It's also why I think that we need to be spending more time thinking about how is this actually working so well? Why is this adaptive DBS system actually, what is it actually doing in my brain? And how is it working so well for me in particular? Because, I mean, there's not a lot of examples that we can use to actually study this at the moment. I'm, one of, I'm the first, I think I was the first or second person in Canada. And I'm one, I know I'm one of the first worldwide as well. One of like the first hundred or first couple hundred to have this kind of adaptive DBS system actually in place. I would love if I could to talk to the other patients and see if they are having a similar effect or see how, how much better that they're doing compared to their continuous DBS settings as well. Because I have this, I think that the reason why it's working so well is exactly what I said, because of that ability to change and adapt to its environment, to the signals that it's getting, it's giving us the ability to then give new insights into what this whole disease process is. So again, close your eyes and imagine what's happening at the cellular level. Imagine what happens when one neuron blips out and then the next one beside it also blips out. And then think about the ripple effects that it has to the whole circuit that it's part of. And eventually when enough of those neurons actually start to flicker out in any one area, the whole network gets affected, the whole circuit gets affected as well. And uh, yeah, with that though, I'm gonna be finishing my talk for now. You can see here though, if anybody wants to contact me, feel free afterwards, or if you have any questions, I think we have about 15 more minutes left. 